to attacking third we are live on youtube with an nwsl recap show for you we're so happy that you're joining us on youtube make sure you subscribe to us like this video drop us your thoughts on all of the chaos that we witnessed in week five action we want to hear from you let's go Hey, everyone, and welcome into Attacking Third, a CBS Sports Soccer Podcast. I'm Sandra Herrera, lead NWSL writer for CBS Sports. Joined today, as always, by my colleague and co-host Lisa Roman, broadcaster and analyst for CBS Sports. On today's episode, we're chatting all things NWSL Week 5 actions. We've got the recap for you all here today. Quick reminder before we jump into everything, subscribe to us on YouTube. We're also a podcast. Follow, like, and download so that you never miss out on an episode. Lisa. <laughs> <laughs> hey, buddy. How are you? I mean, <laughs> Sandra, we have the greatest jobs in the world that we just get to watch this incredible nutso league, and the end of the <laughs> and then talk about it. We get like, to talk about it. This is uh, it. I mean, yeah, Courtney, I second this. Orlando, like, uh, finally, I agree. Oh. Uh, we got other people in here <laughs> saying Beach Dog Scout, that Bigsby goal was oh, awesome. Man. We're going to get into everything. So, yep. um, Nathan, shout out. First time joining us live. Welcome to the party. It's great to have you here. This is fantastic. We have so many wonderful things to talk about, so many crazy things to talk about. Um, at this weekend was just jam packed. Uh, I really actually liked how the schedule was set up one game Friday, one game Sunday, and then just four on Saturday. It was a really yeah. nice way to bookend our weekend. Yes. And then we get to go live right now at eight 15 on a Sunday night. So uh, it's, it's wonderful. I'm with you. I agree. I was like, this was nice. We can handle this. Want to start a few to, you know, keep our eyes on and on Saturday and then able to kind of just cruise into a, to a post game there. I mean, look, we, we, we have to just sort of. Uh, talk about it like encompassing all before we actually jump into these games six is a full slate of games six games on the schedule for nwsl to kind of wrap up week five action um maybe we'll talk about things at the end of this episode kind of as a whole kind of doing things because it's, it's week five so maybe you know we're looking at this as, as perhaps a, a quarter of the season gone by mm -hmm. more or less for these teams which is Maybe if we're looking, if the if we're trying to do the math and make sure the math is mathing, maybe that's why we got a little bit of chaos. I mean, we finally got teams that have got five weeks under their belt. I think that's a good point. Yeah, you know, and now we're starting to see teams kind of maybe find a, finally gel, and you know, maybe some others kind of figuring out those those kind of. Um, you know, the, those team identities that we've been talking the, so the much pieces about start clicking at this yep. point in the season, because right when you look at like preseason, that's like the very, very beginning. And like, they're not really playing competition, they're not playing tough competition. And yep. then the first week we knew it was going to be chaos, craziness, anything that can happen. And between weeks two and four, things start to settle out. Teams start to find their form, but still it's a little bit unpredictable by week five. It's like, you've got your rhythm. You've got your, um, under, Understanding down as a player and as a team, what your role is, the schedule, whether you're at home, on the road, as a rookie, you're actually starting to like finally feel comfortable in your footing and what's happening. Week five is like where all the magic happens. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm loving it. I I, I, I was also kind of nervous because we're going to throw it back to our preview episode on this, too. We were talking about how it's going to be week five that now you're talking about having a handful of games under your belt if you're, you know, one of these, uh, whether you're a club that's in, in the midst of a rebuild or a retooled or trying to run it back, right? And we made some picks, maybe based on some regular forms and stuff like that. Oh, Kylie, thanks for joining us today. You're saying our predictions are in shambles. Well, guess what? You yeah. are correct. Yeah. We're going to go through them. <laughs> and we have no shame in doing that. We look, we, we made our picks quite confidently. I think, I think we were like, look, it's week five. Mm -hmm. We're starting to see some things and, and teams are kind of, in, you know, letting us know who they are, blah, blah, blah. Right. So we made these sort of confident picks and uh, we're absolutely going to expose, um, you know, which ones were, were wrong. Most of them were, we are of course going to start with the game. That's probably most uh, fresh on everyone's mind right now, since we are going live Sunday evening, we're talking about Kansas city current, versus Gotham FC. The current taking all three points in this one, a 2-0 win over Gotham and a brace for mm -hmm. Dabinia. Talk about teams maybe closing out this first quarter of the season 
in a good place, started out in a not so good place. And now Dabinia is, is back looking good, looking in form, scoring goals for this team and helping the current pick up all three points. What did you think of this game, Lisa? Um, I loved this game. I mean, right before we jumped on it, we talked about how this game was probably the most like normal. Yeah. Normal yeah. of yeah. the weekend. Least, least chaotic. Let's Le okay. Think. That's the term we use. Least chaotic of the weekend. Um, in terms of our pick, you had a draw. I had Kansas City winning this one, um, which is one of the few picks yeah. that I actually got right. The one, the one draw I made was not a draw. Can uh, look at basically bust for bus for you and I. <laughs> uh, but this game was uh, had a little bit of everything, right? I think that it, especially like starting lineups when they dropped. Um, I was surprised not to see Kelly O'Hara. I was surprised not to see Night Schwanger for Gotham getting the start. Um, I was really surprised not to see AD Franch again, not in the lineup, not available um, for Caroline Squablam and this Kansas City side and not even available off the I mean, available off the bench, but like not going to get minutes. Uh, Cassie Miller getting her third straight start, I believe, Challenge Cup regular season and then another regular season. Um, and and playing a good game is Cassie Miller. But just when you look at Franch and Miller, there's a bit of disparity there. We'll talk about it a little bit. Yeah. But um, that was kind of my initial thought process. Uh, of course, fantastic to see Dabinia back in the mix of things for Kansas City and pretty consistently as well. Soto getting the start in the back line for Kansas. Kansas City. Um, there's a lot of positive pieces coming out from, I think, the start of this game. However, as it, it went underway and things started moving and grooving, um, Kansas City putting a lot of pressure on. They had a game plan in this match. They're coming off their first win at home last week. They were back at home, Children's Mercy Park. I think that gave them the momentum. That's why I picked Kansas City. Because I also, if you remember, I also had this game pegged as a draw. And I was yes. like, I'm not going to go draw. I'm going to give all vibes to Kansas City. Yep. Um, and they ran with those vibes for this game. Because they found those seams. I mean, Gotham's back line was like, Swiss cheese at times during this game and, oh, and two claps for Abby Smith because that goalkeeper in the first 30 minutes for Gotham mm -hmm. had incredible save after save after save, putting her body on the line. I mean, Kansas city was offside for a lot of them. However, Abby Smith coming up with massive, massive saves. And then when Kansas city ends up scoring their first goal, it's not until right before the 60th minute mark Dabinia gets her opening goal in the 57th minute. And it was, um, a, a mistake and a breakdown right in, in the back line. Um, so it, that it was really like a tale of two halves in, in the way this game opened up and Kansas city continued to just put pressure on, find those seams. Dabinia is just so dangerous. So, so dangerous when she can get those slip passes through. Um, it really impressive to watch Dabinia find her form in this game. Yeah, it just sort of feels like th this is the player. This is the one. This is the athlete that we were talking about constantly during the free agency period that we were that we were pegging as the top free agent mm -hmm. target for teams to go ahead and try to make their pitch to. Ends up being Kansas City, the winner, uh, you know, in that kind of free agency sweepstakes. But I think when we're talking about teams who are, you know, finishing – this sort of first quarter of, of the season in a better way that they started it. Kansas city is absolutely one of those teams that I think you're circling. Yeah. And not only are you looking at it in terms of overall results, like across their competitions, because if you're, if we're looking at that challenge cup match that they also had, perhaps that was the catalyst to kind of get things going for them. They got a win there. And now they have two consecutive wins, you know, coming out of, of this, uh, of the last two weeks for the regular mm -hmm. season. And not only that, Dabinia has been a key factor in those Massive. games to get those results. So I think you're looking at it in a number of ways. You know, I, I think you also maybe include um, extended minutes and, and consecutive starts for Vanessa Di Bernardo in, right. in that mix as well. Another one of those sort of big three targets that they went out to kind of um, bulk up their, their midfield and sort of see how she's also integrating in the team as well. But I'm with you. I think maybe that first half, maybe it almost feels um, – even even though maybe it maybe wasn't based on, on the first half numbers, but maybe on target, I think it was like three on target for, for Kansas mm -hmm. City versus two on target for, for New Jersey. And I think maybe if you narrow the lens and attempts on target, that 
perhaps it feels more reason, but it definitely felt like more of a goalkeeper's battle in that first totally. half than maybe it did in, in that second half. But I liked what we saw from Cassie Miller and, and from Abby Smith throughout stretches of this game. But um curious, I guess maybe the word uh for Kansas City. We haven't seen a, a start for for 80 French uh, with this team uh, since the, I guess we're looking at the Matt Potter days of this season, which was very short. It was three yeah. games long. Um, and we haven't seen French um, get a start uh, with the team since then. So it's going to be interesting to sort of keep uh, an eye on that because this is a player that is, um, you know, also in the running for, for a national team um, spot, you know, in terms of the world cup uh, that's in front of us, just a couple of, months ahead of us and um i think for for players who are you know trying to utilize this time as like final points of evaluation um they want to try to get out there and get into the mix but if you're for, for for club you're trying to find the right ideal starting 11 you know and this exactly. of the season for your team exactly i think it's important to kind of touch at it from the u.s women's national team perspective and french and and I, I like how you put it very diplomatically like she's in the running but like if you and i were making the roster today we would have french on uh, on our roster right yeah. as one of the three goalkeepers um Alyssa mm -hmm. Nair, casey murphy ad french she's been in the camp she's been called mm -hmm. in but now it it's very interesting that she's not playing with Kansas city. And what does that mean? And there's a lot of things that could be happening behind the scenes, right? Maybe she's got a tiny little knock that doesn't take her out of the game, but they're just going to save her a little bit. Maybe they want to get Cassie Miller more minutes because she's gelling well with the team. And, and France has had those conversations with Laco. We don't know what's going on behind those closed doors, but it is very peculiar that she's not getting time in any of these games. Um, yeah. And does and make you wonder a little bit. Well, not to take away from uh, Cassie Mills' performance, because I mean, this is this is a player, in, in my opinion, who could be a starting goalkeeper. Totally. Uh, she is. She got a shutout team. and two goals. She's got and a shutout, and she's getting those starts right now for Kansas City. I mean, this is the maybe people forget there are short memories, you know, when it comes to, to professional sports, but Cassie Miller is the same goalkeeper who had to slot in for a listener with Chicago yep. Red Stars. And that is the goalkeeper that, uh, you know, sort of carried the team on her back all the way through to a championship final, you know? And so this is someone who's not unfamiliar with taking on that responsibility of being a starting goalkeeper. Um, so to see her pick up uh, another clean sheet, I think just sort of can, will can, perhaps continue to see uh, Miller in this role moving forward. And the Gotham That's side of know. things, though, um, I, again, like the tale of two halves, I think I, I thought we saw some good stuff in the defensive shape really early on in that first half. And then I get, is it, is it just a Dabinia factor that we're looking at here that just makes you fall to shambles? Yeah, I think Dabinia definitely – asks a lot of questions of opposition's back lines because of her movement off the ball. So she, the what she's able to do is she'll float between center back shoulders. It's Jean and, and Krieger uh, for Gotham as the center backs tonight in this match. And, and Dabinia really floats between them. So as center backs, you have to constantly not only keep your eye on her, but talking about where she is and what she's going to do. But she can also drop back really, really deep into the midfield because um, she is so comfortable on the ball in tight spaces. So now... Jean and Krieger are passing her off to Allie Long in front of her or, or even Zerboni who's floating to that side. And the issue with Dabinia is she's so quick and deceptive that before you know it, she's on the back shoulder of Long and then she's splitting Edmonds and Jean in, in the outside back center back slotted role. Um, and it's just incredibly hard to keep track of her where she is and what she's doing and that's what makes her so good and that's why Dabinia is able to find herself on the ball in these incredible yeah. positions uh, watching this game tonight I'm also on my laptop and, and taking notes and writing our rundown for this and I look up at one point and I'm like she has to be offside she's got like <laughs> No one around her. No, she's just that good off ball movement. And her teammates, that's the thing about week five action. Her teammates have now realized where Dabini is going to make those runs. And, and on the first goal, Lola Bonta understands, hey, if I play this ball weighted perfectly through the scenes, Dabini is going to get on the end of it. And so that's why the magic is also happening. It's it's mostly from Dabini, but it's also her teammates understanding her movement and where it's going to happen. And, and Gotham is just not staying organized in that back line there was a couple of times that yeah. they thought players were offside they stopped running and they stopped defending they just put their hands up Bruninha did that a number of times and 
you can't do that. You got to stay with the ball. You got to stay with your players. Or um, I'm, <laughs> I'm asking you to get back into your defensive days with Mark <laughs> here. So I keep asking you about the defense, but look, the gets these, she gets these goals, right? She gets the first one um, in the 57th minute. She gets the next one just four oh. minutes later in the 61st minute. And just three minutes later, we've got a triple sub by Juan Carlos Omeros for Gotham FC. A little bit of a message or just trying new things out? I mean, because we see, uh, you know, Nyschwanger come in. We see Anamanu come in. We see Kelly O'Hara come in for Barinha, a player that you just mentioned. I mean, uh, maybe trying to get new looks, trying to see new things. I mean, Kelly O'Hara, is this someone who's coming off the bench to build minutes? Yeah, I think it's a minutes thing for O'Hara coming back after injury and just trying to build minutes. So I, I maybe she wasn't supposed to come in at that point. Um but because of the back-to-back -back goals, they, they were like, okay, well, we'll throw you in at this point. What minute was that? It was like the 64th minute 64th, was all those yeah. sub team. Yep. So uh, maybe for some of those players, O'Hara, you're really only going to give her 15 minutes. But then at this point, it's like, all right, we just got to get you in there. We can't, uh, we got to stop the bleeding. Um, I mean, the second goal for, for, it was a Gotham breakdown, 100%. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't like calling out defenders and goalkeepers, but Abby Smith had such a fantastic first half, especially opening 30 minutes, making incredible saves. And then she makes such a silly mistake as Kansas City plays a through ball on the far right flank and Smith comes out of goal all the way to the sideline and she doesn't get the ball and Cooper yeah. beats her. And so Cooper just sends it centrally because your goalkeeper is on your sideline at this point and you've got runners into the box. It was, and Dabinia, it's essentially an easy tap in for her without a goalkeeper there. So that was a, a total defensive breakdown on Gotham's end and, and Kansas City capitalizing. I think lots of good film here. I think if you're, yeah. if you're Gotham that you want to, probably get right into as soon as possible to try to make those adjustments as you go uh, prepare for week six. Uh, all the points for Kansas City current, Gotham taking the L in this one. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about maybe some other unfortunate scenarios here because we have to take a little bit of time at least to try to talk about what we saw in Houston Dash versus North Carolina Courage. Uh, in case you missed it, breaking news, the weather report. We're a weather show sometimes here. <laughs> uh, we're an injury report show sometimes. We're a weather show sometimes. Uh, we're, 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 we take all different kinds of themes. We love a theme here. But for Houston Dash and North Carolina Courage, this game was ultimately abandoned due to severe weather God, i hate was, that i hate that that's yeah. the term that is used abandoned abandoned but that's exactly yeah. what it is that's it's exactly like such a right. harsh word it's like but yeah. it's like maybe it's appropriate it feels right to you it is. In a sense. you know I, I guess also if you're on the houston dash side of things you're like this was absolutely abandoned i never got my mm -hmm. chance. I mean, this this one ends ultimately uh, after 53 minutes or so, a 1-0 scoreline in favor of North Carolina Courage. Uh, it does count as a win for them. They receive all three points, a goal for Tyler Lucy. Big for her. I mean, this was That's a player that they went out and acquired in the offseason um, and finally opening up the, the goal scoring account with them in the regular season. Uh, but hard to, I mean, I think if you're the dash, I mean, it's tough not to feel hard done by, you know, something that you can't control, which is ultimately literally the weather. Oh, yeah, you're pissed off. You're totally pissed off if you're Houston. Yeah. Um, this game happening in Houston, and there was a giant lightning storm coming through. So at the time, honestly, of the the initial weather delay, um, it, if you looked at the radar, because, hi, we are a weather channel here. I pulled up the radar, <laughs> and I was like, what's actually happening in Houston? Uh, cause I am in Philadelphia. I'm not there. And it was just giant lightning storm coming through. Yeah. So it's pretty devastating that that's how it happened. I mean, they played as much as they could. And, and how the rules shake out is if you play – uh, 45 minutes. Uh, if you play one full half, it can be considered a full game. So if this game ended before the first half whistle had blown, um, it would have ultimately been a forfeit. I believe that's how it goes um, or would have had to be rescheduled or something like yeah. that. But because they had started the second half, played um, into the second half with the minutes that they ultimately played 52 minutes um, and the goal from Tyler Lucy being the only one on the scoreboard that's how it ends and and for Houston uh, at 52 minutes there's still a lot of soccer left to play a lot of soccer yeah. left to play um, but this was also the second goal for North Carolina the first one that they scored earlier in the game ended yeah. up being called back I hated that Hated that, that as well. <laughs> hated that as well so you think like oh they're gonna Houston catches a little bit of a break here it's it's 
it's now back to zero zero. Uh, but then as soon as Tyler Lucy gets this, this goal in the 33rd minute, um, assisted by Emily Fox, that's the combo and the duo you, you like to see the Fox to Lucy, those, uh, off season trades paying off for Sean Nahas and, and North Carolina, because this was a big win for North Carolina. They needed this win, but it is such a heartbreaker for Houston because now Houston has lost their undefeated streak. This is how they yeah. lose it. And yeah. only 52 minutes when you're supposed to play 90. That's why yeah. the games are so long. Well, look, sad. I let's have fun with it. Let's play a little bit of a, what if at, at this mm -hmm. point, if this game goes 90, do you think Houston get one, gets one back or gets the win? I don't. I know. I don't think so either. The way that North Carolina was playing, um, it, they looked good. North Carolina looked really good. You and I both picked Houston to win this game I know. as well. I just know. so we're aware. Just so yeah. everyone's aware. Just so everyone knows. We're actually putting ourselves on blast here. Yeah. I'm over here giving us a redo uh, in terms of the what no, if. No, and I don't think there. so. North but Carolina no. was was looking pretty good. They were. I mean, even I think even if, just looking at like just sort of the, the numbers in this game and, 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 and the directions in which it was going, even just looking at the complete, the, the number of like passes, like 390 compared to 210 from Houston, they just were not seeing the ball. Um, yeah. in, in this game so it's curious to think about but you know it's they called it and um it's maybe good to sort of have on on record because the last mm -hmm. time this happened in the league was a very long time ago um maybe people forget about that it's not the first time that a game unfortunately has been affected or impacted by weather um but we'll get the chance to uh you know take a look and, and see and uh, pay attention to the weather yeah. around the rest of the games, because I have a feeling that uh, things like rain doesn't, you know, it's not going to go away when we're taking a look at uh, oh, summer storms. When we're taking a look at uh, the stretch of the season that will go through the summer, but we'll see. They we don't have too much to talk about for, for Houston and North Carolina, unfortunately, because there was only 52 minutes of play, <laughs> but we want to talk about some draws next that happened across the weekend. So stick with us after a quick break. Draws, 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 and more draws. Let's talk about some draws. Let's start with Chicago Red Stars versus Washington Spirit. This one ending in a 1-1 one, one draw. Lisa, I think we both went Spirit in this one. If memory serves me correct. Yeah, yeah, we did. Love to put ourselves on blast. We are both <laughs> incorrect. Um, um, were you at this game? I was at this game. It was a delight. I wanted to go see the uh, wanted to go see the Trinity Rodman show. And you know what? Aaron Wright said not tonight. Aaron Wright said, not tonight. Tatum Malazzo also said, not tonight. Yeah. Uh, there, there was a very good defensive effort by Chicago. Made some adjustments. I think, look, throwing it back to the preview portion of this, I said when we were making our picks that if for whatever reason Chicago went into this game against Chicago Red Stars and they still lined up in a three bag without making any adjustments that they were going to lose this game. It turns out they did make a tweak. They did make some adjustments. We mostly saw four in the back uh, and they didn't lose this game, but they didn't exactly <laughs> <laughs> win this game either but uh listen who loves a point in the nwsl i would say most teams in the early stretches of the regular season love a point from time I, I mean time. for washington they say undefeated in this one it's back-to-back -back draws for the spirit um this was a team that came into the weekend undefeated and hey they remained it and chicago picks up points after a, a loss it's two losses to start the year they're coming off a loss they got one i think that um I mean, neither side probably too, too happy with the results of this, but ultimately the way it came down, um, I think Chicago pretty happy with it because Washington controlled the majority of the first half of this game. Um, they moved really slow in possession. They, they're this methodical buildup that Washington has, and then they quickly attack and they find Sanchez and they find Rodman and they look to get inside. Uh, but the possession wise, I don't, I don't know what the numbers were at 45 minutes, but I'm imagine Washington was controlling the possession of this game because they just had the ball for most of it. Um, I think Ashley Sanchez was pretty impressive during this game for Washington spirit, the way that she was able to occupy those half spaces and sit between the lines. Um, it, it, 
asked questions of Washington's defense or excuse me, of Chicago's defense. But you're right. I think that ultimately Aaron Wright, Tatum Malazzo, the back line for Chicago did a really nice job handling what is the most prolific player and the most dangerous one for Washington and Trinity Rodman. They really did a nice job because the way that Washington ultimately gets their goal is on a penalty kick. Um, that that's it. It was, um, I do want to say for a second, when this penalty occurred for a moment there, Amber Brooks was at the spot. I saw that. And we were like, yes, Amber, Brooks." there were a ton of us in uh, taking in this game. I have to send a shout out to, to Andre Carlisle was there covering the spirit in person in, in Chicago. And there were a ton of us uh, in person to cover this game. We were like, yes, Amber Brooks is going to take this PK, but no, it ended up going to hatch. <laughs> yeah, we were like watching it. I was watching it on my screen and I was like, what is Amber Brooks doing there? She's just keeping it warm. What's happening? And then Ashley Hatch comes rolling up on it. That was um, her fourth goal. Ashley Hatch's fourth goal of the year for Washington. So she's uh, leading the way right now or, or tied at the front of the line for Golden Boot Race and her second penalty kick goal. That came uh, right before the half hour mark for uh, Washington. Um, and the way that this was shot for those that didn't get to see it. Alyssa Nair gets hands on it. She does t try to make a save. She guesses the right way. She gets hands on the shot, but it's just too powerful and it still finds the back of the net. But before halftime, Chicago is able to equalize. So the response from the Red Stars was very impressive. What did you think of, of the way they responded on the St. George goal? I loved it. Listen, uh, yeah. I think Bianca St. George's is uh, getting off to a very good start this mm -hmm. season and i think this is this is one of those players when you're looking at um the roster as a whole for chicago that you're going to look for those kind of key figures to make an impact in a game especially now when you're looking at the very long season in front of you and you know you're going to be without mallory swanson who are some of these players that maybe you're going to look to to have those key moments or kind of create those very mo like creative moments of brilliance on the pitch. And I think for, for Chicago Red Stars, maybe one of those players is, is likely Bianca St. George's. So not only did I like that this was a player who continued to show her ability on the ball with this team, I liked that they gave the two rookies the, the start yeah. together. We got to see yeah. Penelope Hawking, Allison Schlegel go, go ahead and, and get a start together as rookie, which is not something that we had necessarily seen. We've seen them get some playing time together, but not a consecutive start and sort of build over the long stretch of a game. And uh, I like what we're seeing out of Chicago's rookies. This is a I mean, Schlegel gets the assist. On it's the, a, yeah, on it's, the it's, a, it's a tough goal. league to, to eat up some minutes, and a lot of those first year players are, are starting to to get some more time uh, with, mm -hmm. with Chicago. I thought it was a, a great response, but I also noticed in that second, it, it almost sort of felt like this team was getting so into their defensive shape where I was like, wow, are they just killing this game off at the 50th minute? Yeah. Um, but that's the thing about Chicago at times. I think that's a bit, you know, within embedded within their kind of team identity and culture at times that they are a team that will kind of just like, organize you to death yeah and sometimes they can do that um and it was a little curious for me but i think this was this was really something that uh the defensive backs really really wanted because kind of talking to some of these players in the post game afterwards they talked about how tough that was to come out of that game against the rain having conceded five goals that they wanted to have a better performance a better response to that casey krueger one of those players available in post game and said that that was very tough and it was actually really emotional to kind of come off and, and make sure that they built off of that game and had a better performance, um, you know, in their following week against another team that has a very good attacking presence, whether it's, you know, Rodman on the ball or Sanchez or Hatch, et cetera, et cetera. So not a win, but I think uh, maybe a bigger moral victory perhaps for mm -hmm. if you're on the Red Star side of things. Yeah, I agree with that one. And and you're you're right. The defensive shape for Chicago, they switched, right? In the middle of the game, they went from a three back to a four back, mm -hmm. um, which shows I think the organization of this team and their their off ball IQ and, and the ability to be able to do that while still defending against some of the the fastest and most dangerous front three in Hatch, yeah. Sanchez and Rodman. Pretty impressive. Yeah, no, for sure. Let's maybe talk. Okay, let's maybe talk about another draw because we've got three of them to, to chat about in this segment. Let's talk about one that actually produced a high level of goals. We're talking about Portland Thorns FC versus Ooh. Angel City FC, a 3-3 three, three scoreline. We got treated to a sixer 
in this one after dark y'all you love to see it of course prediction time i believe we both went portland thorns yes. in this one we both and we are both incorrect and it is a draw <laughs> uh yeah this game had everything all of the action that needed um it didn't kick off until 10 30 right so or 10 so it was a late night action nwsl after dark um and it started it literally from end to end there was not a dry moment it, throughout this game because Alyssa thompson gets on the board first for angel city uh goes up one nil she's if this goal from Alyssa Thompson to start this game is very, very indicative of Alyssa Thompson and her skill because she picks up the ball practically at the halfway point and she's able to use her skill and then her pace. I mean, this is like one of the fastest players I've seen play. Thompson has a great burst of speed. She cuts back onto her right foot when she gets inside the box. She loses her defender. She honestly makes Kelly Hubley look silly. And that is very hard to do because Kelly Hubley is one of the top defenders in the league. And Thompson just makes her look silly uh, and finds the back of the net, but Portland responds, right? It was also a very like back and forth game. It's not like angel city went up three, nothing. And that then, was frantic. <laughs> yes, it was incredibly frantic. There's a penalty kick, um, uh, three penalty kicks this weekend. And, and this is another one. Uh, Hina Sugita burying this for Portland thorns. Um, that's around the half hour mark. So at this point it's one, one This penalty kick called against Julie Ertz as well, because we got to see Julie Ertz get the start for angel city. Um, it, it's Morgan Weaver just streaking down the sidelines and and I think Weaver had a great game but she, Weaver sends the cross into the box it's looking for Crystal Dunn and Earths just takes out Dunn penalty kick and before you know it it's 1-1 all tied up um, but I was very impressed with Morgan Weaver throughout this game this is a player that at the start of the year I said that she needs to step up and I think Sophia Smith is allowing a lot of opportunity for Weaver to step up because they're playing off the ball really well together they're they're feeding each other really well and before you know it Weaver it helps draw this penalty kick right she's the one that plays the ball into the box and then she responds with a goal of her own at around the 65th minute in the second half for portland yeah i liked her build into this game because i mean there was a bit of an opportunity here let's be real sophia smith did not get the start in this game and i think when you look at that you're like okay who's it gonna be in this game because i think sophia smith is has so often showed that she is the catalyst and the conclusion. I think when it comes to Portland Thorns and their attack, she's either serving them up or getting them in the back of the net. And so to sort of see Weaver and in a game like this, be able to kind of build over time without her attacking counterpart and someone in, in, in someone is Smith. Uh, I thought it was, a, thought it was a good game from her. And I, I like that, you know, obviously she's able to get on the score sheet and sort of get rewarded for that. But I mean, service for Moultrie as well. Another player I thought had, had a good game for, uh, for for the thorns as well. I think that, that's the beauty of a game like this where all this chaos so you could maybe take like these little five minute to ten minute stretches of the game and pick out an MVP for that five or ten minute stretch of oh the game. Oh my gosh. I mean yes I know what you're talking about but I'm gonna disagree. It's Bella Bixby. How often do we get goalkeepers? I was building up to it. <laughs> I'm building up to it. I'm build we gotta build it up and hype it up as much as possible. Spoiler because it alert. Was, <laughs> it was such an epic moment, historic moment if we really want to keep it real listen i don't know of a draw that could have felt any more like a game winner other than this one particular moment we're talking about at the death when there's nothing else left to be had bella bixby off of a set piece corner kick and a back heel goal <laughs> to make it all level and to split the points angel city Thought they were about to spoil that party and Bella Bixby had other plans. Massive. This is massive. It's back-to-back -back corner kicks that Portland ends up having. And Bella Bixby is in there for both of them. She's in there for the first one and it doesn't happen. She's got to sprint back halfway. And then there's another corner kick for Portland. And she's standing right in front of Didi Hadachich for Angel City's goalkeeper. And... Um, the ball, they, they interviewed her post game and they're like, tell us what happened. And she was like, I don't really know. The ball just landed to me and I just kicked it <laughs> and she didn't even know it went in. It ends up being a back heel, which was very cool. Um, only the second goalkeeper in NWSL history to score Michelle Betos being the first one. Oh, also when Michelle back. Betos played for Portland. So it's gotta Looking be a Portland back. thing. It's a Portland Maybe. thing, I think. Maybe something special up there in the water in the Pacific something. Northwest. We'll see. We, we also was... saw Julie Ertz. 
doing Julie Earth yeah. things, back yeah. to scoring goals off corner kicks and set yeah. pieces. A, a well, set piece. Not yeah, oh, yeah. Kick, yeah. yeah make, making herself a threat in those uh on those set piece corners again, which is something that she was quite comfortable doing for, for country. She wasn't always targeted for, for club. I will say that having watched mm-hmm. her a bunch of times in, in Chicago, but it was great to see uh, a player like that kind of really really we're talking about reintroducing herself to a lot of eyeballs maybe who have forgotten about her presence on the pitch and what that could mean for a team but this was a delightful end of all chaos uh, after dark at its finest hour for sure absolutely shout out to peace mode it was mm-hmm. disney movie <laughs> worthy for sure oh. let's talk about another draw though because of course we've got a trio of them to talk about uh the 1000th nwsl game in its history was between Racing Louisville and O.L. Reign. By the time this game kicked off, they rang in the milestone. And, of course, it ended in a delightful 2-2 draw. Well, maybe not so delightful if you're Racing Louisville. Because, again, let's take it on back to the picks, Lisa. In this one, we were going the way of the rain. Yeah. So you you said O.L. Reign and you said goals. And I said O.L. Reign narrow. Um yep. I'll take the four goals. So you take the goals. I'm, I'm trying to toss you a bone here. I got to take something. Gosh, tough mm-hmm. this week. Look, talking about tough. T U F F. Too <laughs> ugly for feedback. I love when I you feel, say that. <laughs> I feel for racing, man. Look, we're taking it back to the, to the preview. Yeah, we were like, listen, they were one of these undefeated teams in the first three ish weeks of the season, but there were a lot of common threads from their previous season that I think was that has been kind of haunting them because it's a team that has struggled to close out a game or squeak out that win. And they've got another one on the schedule done and dusted that they can look at and say, God, we let another one get away from us. They had race. They racing had OL rain on the ropes. Yep. Sure did. And just were unable to close one out. They uh, talk yeah, about just, a comeback from the rain in this one. Honestly, like a, a heartbreaker for Racing Louisville fans, for Racing Louisville players, because this game was all Louisville. They start strong. They start early. Opening goal coming in the seventh minute. Paige Monahan's first goal for the big perp. Um, and, and then DeMello gets another one right at halftime, 45 minutes going into the halftime up to nothing. Fantastic. Racing Louisville is really happy about this. Um, Megan Rapino gets the start for OL rain, right? We've talked a lot about Rapino's minutes and how she's building them back up and she ends up getting the start, but Louisville says, Hey, you're in our house and this is completely our game. Um, 100% we're going to own this. And the first goal that OL Reign scores, um, it's Megan Rapino who scores it, but it comes off a penalty kick. So this is our third of three penalty kicks that happened this weekend. Um, and it's a foul on Katie Lund against Jordan Heitema. It is a foul inside the box penalty kick for sure. But the fact that the goal for OL Reign doesn't even come in the run of play initially, I still had a lot of faith yeah. for racing. Well, I was like, man, this is a backbreaker, but you're still, up 2-1 at this point. You just got to hold out for the rest of the game uh, because this was right around the 70th minute. 68th the foul was called and then by the time it scored it's around the 70th minute Um, and of course it's Megan Rapino finding the back of the net like of course are you kidding me fantastic Um, and at this point I'm like Racing Louisville still got this they've still got this I want them to win just even though I picked all rain I did because how well Racing Louisville was playing how the pieces were coming together Um, Savannah DeMello I think was having a fantastic game so good fantastic game she ends up getting two yellow cards on a frustration play not even a foul that happens the whistle is blown the ball lands to her and she just kicks it straight in the air and that's her second yellow so now around just after the 70th minute mark Louisville's down 10 players and Savannah DeMello who is yep. arguably one of the best players in the first 70 minutes of that game is now sitting on the bench Yep, not a scenario you want no. to find yourself in at all I mean and it's painful too even maybe just just Going through the rundown of the final numbers and something like this, we're talking 16 shots for racing versus 10 by the rain. Eight attempts on target for Louisville compared to four from the rain as well. And this one, seven corners for racing compared to two from OL. I mean, again, 
tough. I just got to repeat it. I mean, I'm still looking. Oh. I think I think that's where we're at. That's where we're at in this first. When we're looking at racing specifically. That's where we're at in this kind of first quarter of the season. We're still looking for the win, for the full 90 minute performance from this team to go ahead and like really kind of maybe propel them into some better positioning on this table. So um, reading the chat right now, Sad Dinga is saying, hey, feel bad for DeMello. She'll learn from this, right? So she totally yeah. will. I'm with you on this one, Sad Dingus. But Sandra, do you think that what DeMello did was warranted as the second yellow? Oh, man. You're asking me to be an official right now? I can't be no, an official. I'm asking you to be a fan. I'm asking you to be a fan. <laughs> I'm, asking you to be a fan. <laughs> I'm like, I'm on a vodka. Listen, the, the the podcaster in me says, sure, valid. The 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 neutral in me who just wants to watch the yeah, game. Yeah, that's what I'm, I'm asking. I'm screaming my head off and saying, what? I agree. Yeah. I agree. It's Even tough. as someone that like myself that knows the rules very well, like, yes, that's you're allowed to do that, right? At you can make a case for you it. You can like, make a case for it completely, especially how the player has played throughout the game. And she had already received a yellow. And now this yeah. was a call against her team. And in frustration, she does kick the ball. But like, it, yeah. for those that didn't get to see it, she kicks the ball straight up in the air, yeah. straight up in the air. It's, it's also one of those things where it's like, maybe she was taking some frustration out and <laughs> You and, never, and you no never know. With and play. all of a sudden the ball shoots up and you're like, oh, crap. <laughs> yeah. It's not like she skied it 30 yards into yeah. the stand, 50 rows up. And it was like, I'm getting this ball out of here. Mm -hmm. It's not like she kicked it the opposite way towards yeah. the goal, just like getting the ball away. She literally just kicked it up in the air. I hate it. I don't know. But the fact that she was already on a yellow is like, okay, right? Yeah. Like you kind of warranted into that. If she didn't have a yellow, I don't think it would have been a call. And all. I think that's what it is. I think at this yeah. point – the you you're, you've been given the official the, the official yellow the 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 ref the center referee is you're already in the book you know so it's like don't the whole concept of like don't give that official a reason to give you that second yellow yeah. so is it a harsh second yellow yeah i think sure i think there's also the the, the the i'm sure there's a counter argument to be made about you know the fact that this is you know, it's women profession. It's women's professional sport, and it's a player showing mm -hmm. emotion. And perhaps that's different. You know, if it's if we're looking at a different league, and it's not a women's pro league. You know, and it's not that type of athlete making that move. And it's it's a it's it's a woman athlete getting punished for showing emotion. There's and I'm in agreement with that. There's there's, yeah, a, there's no. all of again. There's that side of the case to be made as well. So I uh, yeah, just just sort of being a neutral, just someone who loves to watch nwsl week in and week out i, I hated to see it didn't uh, like it breaks my heart i think that would have changed the game honestly because at this point uh oh rain had just scored it's it's only 2-1 louisville still has the lead but uh jordan Haitema, who draws the penalty kick to get the first goal for ol rain she equalizes in the 89th minute um an assist from alana cook she cook curls this ball in it's lofting and and Haitema just jumps up, uses her head, finds the back of the net. Um, and that's, that's how it all Oof. ends out. I think a game changer for sure. That It that shouldn't feel like off. a heart. It shouldn't feel like a heartbreaker. And yet, yeah. and yet here we and are. It does. I know. And even though does. we both picked out well rain, we're like, poor Lou. I know. <laughs> that's the beauty of being wrong on these picks. We quickly we shift got, our perspective. We got 70 minutes for Megan Rapino in this match. 70 we minutes. About, we talked about that in the preview too. We mm -hmm. said, listen, what are, are we starting to finally see mm -hmm. the buildup of minutes for Megan Rapino? And that's a big jump from where we were looking at. We saw like 15 minutes at one point, And then I think another 20 minutes and another, and it was like, yeah. she was up to like 32 something total minutes. And, Good on Megan Rapino for being able to to get a good chunk of this game behind her. And you know what? It's a big game too. The 1,000th game. It was good to see a lot of those veterans out there who've been part of the league for so long, specifically with the Rain franchise. Um, a two-two draw. I'll take the I'll take the the heavy loft the score line because I got to get something yeah. out of these predictions. And we'll see because we've got one more game to talk about and we'll run down some of these standings for you all as well to close out the episode. So stick with us after a quick break. Get breaking news. Big news coming out of the NFL today. Highlights and instant reactions. The largest final round comeback in four championship history. We're down to the final four. I just want to take time to analyze greatness. Talk winners and losers with a guy who's already a big winner. CBS Sports HQ. It's all sports all day long. Listen, I think we saved the best for last year because we're talking about Orlando Pride and their first regular season win. 
in 2023, and it comes against San Diego Wave FC. Three to one. Winner, winner. Chicken dinner belongs to Orlando Pride. Handing the Wave a loss, not just any old loss. It's a loss at home. Let's talk about it. And let's talk wow. about those picks as well because we were wrong once again. <laughs> yes, of course. We both had San Diego Wave taking the win at home. The way the standings had shaken out at this point, um, San Diego, Casey Stoney, we were like, yeah, yeah, yeah she's got this. Um, Seb Hines, Orlando Pride, they had other plans. For those oh, yeah. that are just listening as a podcast, Sandra's rocking her Orlando Pride Highway Woman kit right now. She, she looks great. She's wearing it proudly because – Although she didn't get her pick right, she's wearing the kit. Listen, I had, I had to come correct in this one because I, I went with the wave for mm -hmm. all the reasons that anyone else this week probably might have gone with the wave. The fact that they have a good coach, Casey yeah. Stoney, who typically has her team prepared week to week the, for the simple fact that they've got good attacking pieces. And I'm not talking about Alex Morgan. I mean, they've got a Sophia Jacobson. They've got Amira Ali, who's Al Alex Morgan didn't get a single minute. minute. In this no, game. no, no. We didn't Nothing even play in this game, but they've got Amir Ali, who's really, I think, coming into form in this second season with San Diego. And they've got a young, budding talent in Jaden Shaw, who did get on the board for this team. All of those reasons, you take a look at that and you're like, yeah, maybe I want to go with San Diego Wave. And I think we're included in that as well. We made the, we made the case for making this pick. But I want to remind everybody that in this preview, I said that when Seb Hines took over as interim head coach last year, the pride were unbeaten against the wave and he got the better. He got the better of Casey Stoney and the wave. And he did it again with newer players I know. in the mix and got the win three, one over San Diego. I love this for Me the team too. taking their steps in the rebuild. I thought there were some very good stretches of play in which they looked dominant. What a game from Viviana Villacorta for me, mm -hmm. in my opinion, one of the most impactful players, I think, for the Pride uh, that evening. Totally. Uh, you love to see it. You're yeah, really I, I think Via Corta is a player that really started to hit her stride at the end of last year, frankly, under Seb Hines. Um, he put her in positions to succeed and to excel. And I agree with you 100%. Via Corta controlled the midfield, um, a player in just her second year, right, in the league, going up against Danielle Colaprico. A, an incredible yeah. veteran in this league. Um, uh, Sophia Jakobsen having to control a little bit of that play against a, a Swedish international superstar. Um, and Via Corta looked like a solid professional that had been out on the pitch for years winning championships. Um, she played above her, her stature. This was a very, very good game because of all of the factors that we've talked about, but also the way everything unfolded, because as this game uh, gets going, it's uh, as you just mentioned, Jaden Shaw, the a young superstar for Casey yes. Sony and San Diego wave getting on the board first in the yep. opening 15 minutes of this game. Jaden Shaw um, has a fantastic run past the near post. She just flicks it on and it finds the back of the net, a really, really great goal from Shaw. Um, and, and it, gets past Anna Morehouse in goal for, for Orlando pride. And I was like, Oh no, 13 minutes into yeah. the game. It's, like It might not, it might be ugly. I had the same thought. I was like, this I isn't going to be thought. good. Like, come on, Orlando, like, hold on a little bit. You're on the road. You're at Snapdragon. The crowd's going crazy. What can you do here? And what Orlando does is they respond. They get their first rolled goal, their first goal in a couple of games, and it comes from Michaela Clough, the second-year player, um, rookie out of BYU last year, and she had a lot of ups and downs last year. I was high on this player when Orlando drafted her last year. I thought she was going to make a much bigger impact, but it wasn't the right system. It wasn't the right fit last year. Now Clough is finding her her groove on the ball. I think her and Via Corta play really well together centrally. And on this corner kick, Clough uh, is back post. She uses her head and finds the back of the net. One one. Orlando ties it up. Uh, just twenty five minutes into this game. Yeah, you know, at the top of this episode, Lisa, we gave a lot of love to Dabinia 
think we got to give a lot of love to her Brazilian compatriot in Adriana. This was a player yeah. that Orlando picked up in the off season. One of their kind of touted is it, it kind of touted as one of their, their, their big off season signings, right? This is an Orlando pride team that was among other clubs that maybe tried to take some swings at the free agency market and kind of maybe missed out on some targets. But then to see, these pieces, not only these young players, these second year player, players who are maybe taking those next steps, um, or even the rookies. Uh, mm -hmm. We even touched on Messiah Bryden and Emily Madrill and their kind of continued development with the pride. But a Adriana getting not just a goal in this one, but serving up an assist as well. I really, really liked the effort uh, in, in this game from this player. And my goodness, this goal that she scored. Oof. I mean, you don't often talk about players getting posterized in soccer. You hear that more in basketball. But you, you see Adriana na nail this goal. And not only does it get through Naomi Guillermo, but it also gets past the keeper, dinks off the, <laughs> the, the post, the far post, and into the net. It was a delight to see. A very, very good goal from Adriana. And this is the third goal coming for Orlando from this player. Um, the second one in a string of all this coming from Haley McCutcheon. Um, this was a header goal as well from outside the box. And, and it put Sheridan on her heels. That's the thing. Keelan Sheridan in goal for San Diego is one of the best goalkeepers in the world. She is the best goalkeeper in the world. Canadian international. She just won gold. Um, she's going to be going to the World Cup. This is a incredible, incredible talent. And I don't think she had like a horrible game, right? Like the goals that Orlando scored were very good goals. That's the thing. It's not like there was mistakes that happened or major breakdowns with San Diego. Um it was really good play by the pride that beat San Diego. This was one of the best games, frankly, the way that it all played out, the excitement of it. Of course, Adriana getting her first NWSL goal, the assist, all of that. But um, that that's the reason that you and I picked San Diego to win. Kaylin Sheridan is standing there between the sticks. Yeah. And it's really hard to get past her. And Orlando was able to move her and do it effectively, right? I mean, like, as you said, Adriana's goal goes between Germa's legs. Um, yeah. as a goalkeeper, you're not expecting that to happen. You, you're expecting that space to be covered. So like a, a lot, a lot to kind of take in on this one. Yeah, for sure. Listen, it, it was, uh, it almost, it almost sort of feels like, uh, at this point when we're talking about taking a look at things as a whole, the last five weeks of regular season play that it also includes a challenge cup round one series for some of these teams, I can't believe it's already going to be May. We're already looking back at this first quarter of a season, maybe kind of kind of behind us. And, and some of the things that, that we're taking away, it's Orlando's getting a win. Kansas City is finishing better than they started. Uh, Chicago is available, is uh, capable of making adjustments, question mark. You know, like these weird little things that we're starting to see. But something that has not changed since week one is Portland Thorns staying number one in the standings just to close out they are at number one with 11 points we've got oil rain right behind them at number two san diego wave at number three new jersey new york gotham fc at number four washington spirit at number five houston dash at number six and on the outside looking in is north carolina courage at number seven angel city fc at number eight racing louisville at number nine chicago red stars in 10th place Kansas City current in 11th and Orlando Pride in 12th place. It's going to be a fun May, and we'll do this again. We'll do this again. We'll go. We, we, we love to do this. We like to go month to month to month and take a look at some of these standings, and we're going to keep that going in 2023 just like we did in 2022. But that's all we've got for everyone today on our Week 5 recap. Thank you all so much for listening to Attacking Third, as always. Download, follow, listen to us anywhere you get your podcasts. You can watch us too. Subscribe to us on YouTube to get alerts for whenever we go live at youtube.com slash attacking third. And we'll be back with more content for you all this week. Make sure you stay tuned. For Sandra and Lisa Roman, this was Attacking Third.